So now moving forward, we have our next speaker, Dr. Manjusi Parlam, and I'm very happy to say that she was my BSc batchmate also, and many of her batchmates are attending today also to her presentation. So Dr. Manjusi Parlam is currently working as senior lecturer at Faculty of Health, Psychology, and Social Care at Manchester Metropolitan University, and she's also regional co-lead northeast uh, northwest of England Chief Nursing Officers Black and Minority Ethnic Strategy Advisory Group. She did, BSc, she did her BSc nursing from Ames, MSc in nursing studies from Manchester University, and PhD in research culture. She is a professionally experienced teacher, senior manager, leader, and quality analyst with international experience in clinical research and innovation, business development, and project management. She has a wide range of transferable knowledge, skills, and experience. She has been an invited speaker, trainer, and presenter for different healthcare sectors. She's a very strong advocate for equality and diversity and heavily involved in delivering the quality and diversity agenda. She's also the secretary of Nurses Hypertension Association in UK. She has backed ED Championship Award and was the finalist for British Indian Award and NHS Windrush Award. So we welcome Manju for the presentation. Hi, thank you so much, Smriti. That's a long one to go and um, I'm very privileged to be here. Um, can you all hear me properly? Yes. Yes, good. Uh, thank you, ma'am, Ruth, uh, for your wonderful presentation. I'm really not sure whether I'll be able to follow on from that. Um, as um, Smriti has uh, mentioned, I'm a friend of her and I studied with Smriti and um, I'm privileged to be in front of Ramit sir, who was our teacher from Ames. Um, and I have quite a lot of colleagues, Sanali, uh, Manju, Dantabani, and a couple of our seniors and juniors um, within the uh, participants. Um, I'll try to um, talk about the publication strategy in layman's language. So I haven't put quite a lot of academic words or academic literature within it because I just thought I'll try to explain what we currently do in UK and how do we actually promote publication within academics and uh, researchers and nurses. So am I um, okay to share my slides? Yes. Sorry. We can see the slides, ma'am. Okay. Okay. So, uh, my name is Manju Siparam, and I'm a senior lecturer at Manchester Metropolitan University. Um, like Smriti said, uh, I'm a very strong advocate for equality and diversity, um, and my passion is clinical research. So I was quite impressed to hear Dr. Roberts' interest in clinical research and how research is done. Um, so I'll talk about, um, you know, um, how do we publish, why should we publish, what and when to publish, who should be published with, where to publish, raising your research profile and reviewing your publication strategy and some sort of ideas around workshop. So this is basically to give you an idea about how can you improve your publication and publication outputs from research or academic literature. So why do we normally publish? Um, as every academic, um, it is an essential part of our career and every university or organization you belong to always have a mission to improve the quality and the number of publications yeah, that you create. Um, it's a matter of reputation and prestige, both for individual as well as for the institution. Um, and it is obviously a potential track record with an important criteria for academic uh, reputation and recruitment. Uh, definitely for successful grant applications, they do clearly say one of your output should be publication and uh, that should be underpinned by strong um, academic output or strong publication record and it is one of the um, conditions that the grant board is normally present that you should have an output of publication so it helps us to uh, personally if you think any job you apply currently in academia or even in research people look at your cv and see how many publications you have got and uh, that too um, in high impact factor journals. So it helps you to raise your profile 
it exposes your arguments, your ideas, and your hypothesis to synthesize or scrutiny or critique your um, ideas. It helps you to uh, get your findings into the public domain. So any research that you do um, would be um, produced through the publication. It definitely raises the intellectual curiosity, increases the H index and improve uh, your job prospects. So, um, you know, if you are going for a, in UK and in developed countries, there's always a um, title as readership or professorship based on your um, research profile or academic profile. And it also helps you to make a difference. As I, for example, writing policies, um, you know, guidelines, government organizations, um, policies and frameworks. So based on your publications, you always have that scope to make a difference to the healthcare um, across a local, regional and national and international levels. And all of the above should be personally satisfying and career supporting. So um, whatever you do at the end of the day, if you publish, that's known as it's your output. And that helps you to actually uh, satisfy you emotionally and um, psychologically. So what and when to publish? Obviously, as we all know, it's for research integrity. It conforms to institutional best practice. Um, so you make sure that you uh, uh, detach, you do not detach yourself from the research integrity. You follow the correct path and make sure that you maintain that integrity for research to publish. Um, it helps you to avoid underreporting of research findings. So you make sure that whatever you have done for your research is actually published through research. Uh, avoid salami slicing, and I'll come back to it in my next slide. Um, make sure you have a time scale. Um, say, for example, you have a broad plan for your future research and um, develop a plan for your, um, say, for example, two year or five year plan for your research as well as your uh, uh, publications. And also give time to yourself, do not kill yourself. You know, think about how are you going to do your research? Um, how are you actually going to plan your um, publications? What are the timelines? Uh, who are going to be involved in it? Where do you get the funding from? How do you get the ethics or the governance aspects related to your project, your research? How do you collect the data? And make sure you keep a diary of it. It will definitely help you to actually write the article at the end, so uh, keep a diary and also keep the grant chart or keep a timeline of your events so that it will be um, easy for you to follow on when you write your article. So salami slicing, like um, all of you know, slicing of research into different pieces, um, which results in different papers and people normally tend to do that, particularly in PhD. Um, you know, people try to take each chapter out from your PhD and write a publication so that you get five out of uh, one. Um, so never ever do salami slicing. And the reason is that you um, take out the data in its entire format and uh, you slice a full salami into different pieces and that doesn't help for the research integrity as well as for the research output. So who should you publish with? Um, it's always a concern for many people, you know, where should I publish, who should be published with? So there are many authorship guidance um, around and guidelines around who should you um, publish with, who is actually helping you to um, develop this project and write this uh, project, who actually involved in the grant writing stage, who was actually helping you with the research process. So think about conception and design, acquisition of the data, analysis, interpretation of the data, and then think about drafting the article um, and revising it critically. So who is actually in the peer review process? And do they actually need to be in the uh, publication authorship? Um, and then who actually helps you to finally approve? Do you have an uh, uh, university or your institutional authorship board who actually thinks about who should be in the group? And also think about other contributions, you know, not necessarily academic or um, you know, intellectual contributions. You may have um, other uh, contributions who has actually helped you. So you, you may not necessarily need to use them as your co-author. You can always think about contributing um, personals. So acknowledge them at the end of your um, author, authorship or author list to actually recognize the work that they have done for your project. 
and then always uh, there is a gray area you know people claim to have authorship when they haven't actually met the authorship criteria so when you look at um, you know relevant journals they actually have a criteria for authorship and they ask you to define or justify the co-authorship so the people who are actually joined up with you you have to define them and say you know what they have what have they actually contributed so you have to tell that if you are actually putting people's names just for the sake of getting names, then that is a research misconduct. And people do tend to do that. And I have been asked to do the same. And I'm pretty mm. sure you all have been asked to do the same as well. And we do want to, we all tend to do it just for the sake of friendship, colleagueship, you know, whatever you want to do. So make sure you don't do it because if it's been picked up, this is a main research conduct, uh, misconduct, and it wouldn't be good on your CV. So who should be published with? Um, do you have strategic partnership? You know, do you have links with government bodies, local authorities, other colleges around you, other institutions around you? And um, is it a norm or is it just, um, you know, you want to do this research with many people? Um, is it to promote multidisciplinary functions or multidisciplines um, involvement? Say, for example, linking in with physios, OTs, speech therapy, language therapies, other specialties, humanities, social sciences. It always um, improves the research integrity of your paper. And it also brings you to help, uh, it helps you to bring in more expertise uh, and pooling of skills and resources. Um, and also um, it gives an opportunity for early career research. ECR uh, remains for early career researchers and junior researchers to link up and join up with senior researchers and senior authors to develop their skills and um, authorship or, or the, uh, the writing skills. Um, and also it gives an opportunity for your own institution as well as your colleagues to link in with other institutions. And always uh, make sure that you, know, you don't this process, uh, don't, you don't do this process at the very end of your writing uh, time. You know, make sure you develop this um, uh, collaborations and um, integrations before you start about, uh, before you start to think about your research or before you start to think about your um, publication. Choice of journal is always a challenge, you know, where to publish, what do I do? You know, what journals do you know? And reading your research area. Draw on colleagues and collaborators for recommendations. Um, look at databases listing journals in your discipline, such as Corpus, NCBI. And think about academic and professional body guidance. You know, we have a network, vast network of people around us who could actually guide us and support us with ideas. And if you're not sure, you know, don't feel shy to ask. I was in a meeting yesterday with one of my colleague um, because one of my paper was rejected five times. And I'm not um, shy to say this, you know, it's quite um, easy to get rejected. Um, and uh, one, two of the journals, I was actually a reviewer and I was quite, I reviewed the papers and I was thinking to myself, my paper stands out much better quality compared to the papers I have reviewed. Still, my paper got uh, rejected. Uh, so I had to go and ask for support and I don't feel ashamed and I even asked support to one of my colleague who's um, just joined the, um, uh, recently joined in our university. Um, and when you give uh, this paper who is very new to my theme and idea, she looked at it and she said, I was trying to combine two ideas into one paper. So she gave me an idea of, you know, dividing my paper into two papers, which is a benefit for me right now. And also think about in a different angle to write my paper. Yeah, it does may, uh, you know, involve uh, using my energy, time and my commitment to the, you know, meet up with these people, call these people, arrange the meeting. But it always helps you at the end to actually develop your idea into a different way, whether you haven't actually thought about it. So yeah, you do get rejections and don't, you know, feel uh, frightened or don't feel shy to talk. Yeah, I have had rejections. So look at the articles similar to the one you want to publish. You know, there'll be quite a lot of articles. Make sure you don't plagiarize. And then uh, shortlist the number of uh, potential journals that you could publish. Um, uh, basically look, at, look out for reputable journals. And I'll come to, um, uh, to identify the reputable journals in my next slides. So, um, 
you know, when you select the journal, uh, if you're applying for big grant, grant uh, or funding bodies, they would have certain criteria to select the journal. So think about, you know, whether you made the criteria for the funder um, to actually select the journal and then journal scope and content. Um, say, for example, you know, ma'am, uh, Robert was using um, a nurse educator. So if your publication is about education, education strategies, um, uh, you know, modes of education, you know, something related to that, obviously go for nursing educate, nurse educator if it's something to do with research or research attitude, research criteria, anything to do with research, you know, look at articles that are talking about nurse research, nurse researcher, qualitative, qualitative work, you choose the articles related to that field. Audience, you know, who are your audience? Are they nurses? Are they specialists? Are they academics? Are they professionals? So think about the audience that you need. Sometimes a nursing article that you write may not necessarily be focused for nurses. It could be for anyone else, you know, physiotherapist, uh, speech therapist. So think about the audience rather than the profession that you are in. Access, you know, is it open access, green access, you know, what are the costs, funder rules, you know, what is the criteria? HEFKI is the education board here for the Indian organization, you know, think about the Indian uh, boards that you control. Review process, you know, do you have peer review process in place? Make sure you have all that in place before. What is the acceptance rate before um, you submit the paper? What are the time scales? Prestige, you know, is it prestigious enough for your organization? Is it prestigious enough for you to publish in that paper? What are the metrics? And I'll come to the metrics later on in my slides. And is it trustworthy? And I'll come to that, come to that as well in later. So what is predatory journals? You know, have you, you we all hear, hear about predatory journals. And um, do we think about all this? We, I'm pretty sure you all are ended up, ended up ending up with a lot of emails from these journal um, authors or journal organizations asking you to submit your um, uh, articles. And sometimes these ghost journals or predatory journals um, wouldn't declare the fees that they have or you know how um, relevant they are. They would ask you, they would uh, ask for your manuscript, they ask for all the papers you submitted. And then they clearly say that, oh, you have a fee of $1,500 or 500 pounds or whatever. And you obviously reject to give that. And then uh, and at the end, what they have is your manuscript, your publication, and in two months down the line, you see that your article is published in their predatory journal or ghost journal. So be careful whenever you get a request, think, uh, look at the um, originality or the, um, uh, you know, scrutinize that um, uh, journal before you agree to publish. Then comes the bibliometric measures. You know, what do you, why do we use bibliometry? Uh, it provides evidence of the impact of your research output when applying for jobs, promotion or research funding. Uh, it's a new and emerging areas of research. It identifies potential research collaborators and identify journals where to publish. Um, what are the measures? And I'm not going to go into details. Obviously you all know about it, but I'll just briefly touch. Um, you know, we have citation counts which talks about the number of times a research up output appears um, in uh, documents. H index, you all know about H index. It, method, it measures an author's productivity and impact, H impact. H stands for the number of publications. Field weighted citation impact, it is the ratio of sign, uh, citations received in relative to the uh, expected world average of the subject in the field. That's what I was mentioning, you know, if you are talking about a, um, you know, uh, management of wound care uh, by nurses. So you could actually go into trauma or wound care journal. So how does your article weigh in that field? That is what it stands for. Outputs in top percentile, and you understand what is percentile. So how does your publication stand in the world? Um, if it's UK or US, how does it stand? Journal impact factor is most, most commonly used and, and we still use it um, in UK um, based on the average number of citations. And one of the reasons people use um, salami slicing is to get journal impact factor, to get high number of publications and high number of citations using your own publications, uh, citations within your own uh, publications. So it increases the journal impact, impact factor and citation score. Site score is the average number of citations re received in a calendar year by all items published in that journal. And then you have the journal ranking, Scopus SNP, and item index. And I think in India, you guys use a lot of item index created by the Google Scholar 
which is very recent. Um, so I'm not sure how much research is uh, gone into Google Scholar and you know how reliable is the Google Scholar platform. We don't tend to use it in UK, um, uh, but this is one of the metrics that's used for bibliometry measures. And this, this is adapted from the metrics toolkit licensed under CCBY 4.0. Um, and I have given that in the reference list. So indexing is a kind of bibliographic database. Um, it is the citation between publications, allowing the user to easily establish which later document cite which earlier documents. So you understand, you know, um, um, uh, Professor Rabat, 2005 is mentioned in 2010 article. So that is where the citation index comes. And it's a, it is a reflection of quality and that is being used majorly by all the academic bodies, funding bodies, review bodies, etc. And there are many indexing agencies um, like Google Scholar, um, PsycInfo, PubMed, Medline, Science Direct, Scopus, Web of Science. If you ask me we do, what do we use mostly, we use Science Direct and Web of Science. Um, I used to sit in the uh, research review panel and we, when we review the research output of organizations, we tend to use Web of Science. Um, and in India, I think you guys use UGC index. So there are quite a lot of indexing agencies and you can um, find out a lot of information about that. I just thought I'll briefly mention about these indexing agencies where you go to find out about the data information and the indexing. So when we actually come to um, the publication itself, I think ma'am Ruth has actually covered a lot of it. So I'll just briefly mention again, um, uh, the title should be concise accurate and informative. So when I get the paper to review, we normally tend to read the um, title first and look at the, relay, um, the importance of the title in relation to the article or in relation to the journal. So make sure that you have a um, catching uh, title which captures, like Mam said, the Pico, um, which captures the entire idea that you want to present within your title itself. The abstract is the first thing after the title that we read. Um, it should be easily readable. I don't uh, believe in very strong um, academic words in your abstract. You, know, you need to make sure that the, your reader, the readability is really good and your reader understands what you're writing. And, um, and that's what I was trying to uh, tell in my presentation as well, you know. Try to make sure that um, it is a key part of your whole paper. Make sure that it actually shows the originality, the significance and the rigor that are clearly reflected in your um, abstract. Select accurate keywords and uh, make sure that you have indexed um, your article. And there should be sometimes um, there's a conflict between a person who is reviewing as well as what you're trying to achieve or what you're trying to get out from your publication. So you uh, make sure that you maintain a balance between the reviewer and the writer or the other um, author. So um, like we mentioned before, co-authors, um, you know, the co-authors should have science in their head and that should be their main objective. Um, RF is the um, research um, excellence framework. So how do you um, make sure that the research excellence framework is captured within your science and how the, how the co-author maintains that throughout the um, authorship? Um, if you have collaborated with the leading figure, uh, say for example, um, in UK we have NICE writers. NICE is the National Institute of Clinical Excellence. So if you are in, involving someone from that field, you know, how do you actually include them? It is a uh, kudos for your paper. It's a bonus for your paper to have, you know, high figured uh, contributors and collaborators. And think about the slightly gray area of authorship. Um, and then think about the figures. What is the time? What is the funding you have? How much money you have got? Um, how much um, time of your co-authors that you have got? These are all numbers. Even the time is a number. Um, it is an investment as well. So think about the time that you use for your people. And um, think about adding pictures, tables, etc., to your um, publication. Then obviously, like I said, you know, review, the reviewers will always come back with your feedback. Um, sometimes it's a straight rejection. Like I said, I have had straight rejection and I don't give up. Keep trying, revise and resubmit. And if you still get rejected, maybe there is something wrong with your publication. So you have to rethink and then rewrite it again. And that's what I'm currently doing. 
don't be too disappointed be realistic and expect positives and negatives you know none of us are perfect you know neither you or me and i accept that and you need to accept that you know you are you could be a professor in a lecturer lecturer or a nurse and you could write hundreds of articles but majority of the times you know the or the, always the first go is a no no so pre be prepared for that and be positive you know try to fight for it and keep writing um, this current uh, article i'm writing i have been writing it for last 8 months so take on that so you know we do expect that and um, carefully analyze what reviewers what do they really want uh, if you're uh, unlucky enough to get a review with an overly emotive and over heated comments ignore it and you do end up with that and when you send in your revised manuscript you know try to include a separate document explaining what you have actually changed and if you have a good reason to disagree with the reviewer always say it be assertive assertive means you know say that why you say it's, it's a no no why you don't agree with it assertiveness and competition it's different when you challenge someone with your own right and fight that is competition when you have your own right your own rules and your own beliefs and you actually believe in your beliefs then explain that in an empathetic way that is assertiveness so be assertive when you actually challenge someone with your publication and with their comments raising your research profile in a plan ahead um, get an orsid id um, it's um, i don't know whether you guys use it this is for publications um, when you actually want to publish in you know um, high impact fund journals you have to have this um, orsid id keep your profile up to date Consider sharing your research data, you know, with others. Establish a research data management system. Consider writing, blogging about your research. So, you know, if you're a blogger, um, Smriti, you're one of the good ones. So, you know, think about when you write a publication, think about how to blog about writing your publication. So that's another one you get, you know, you could always get a, um, a journal um, review or a journal uh, intro article out of this blog. Use social media to build research network. Um, I'm not sure about that. Um, people do tend to use it. I tend to use uh, Twitter, but I am really bad in using um, my publications um, as a Twitter article or um, social network article, but people do tend to use it and do have, do uh, make sure that you have a research gate account. Now I'm coming to a publication strategy. You know, how could you actually develop a publication strategy? You know, you could develop a table com combining of your theme, the publication type, where you want to go, is it a book, practice focus, approximate uh, time that you want to do, who are the contributors, who are the co-author, what are the journals that you want to go, the contacts, and you develop a grant chart or you develop a publication strategy and you write uh, in that. Am I okay for the time, Smriti? Um, and then um, rough criteria, I just thought I'll briefly mention about the rough, rough criteria only because um, in UK, we actually use um, a rough uh, research excellence framework as a criteria for publications and we are measured against the research excellence framework for our publications and for our outputs. So it doesn't matter even if I publish in a good journal, sometimes it, it may not meet the cri rough criteria. So it doesn't give me the kudos for my academic career. So um, what is that? And for the rest, they look at the originality. What is uh, different about your research? Yeah, Manju has written something about um, uh, being an insider or reflexivity of um, a qualitative researcher. There's hundreds and thousands of paper about reflexivity. Why does this research, why Manju's research stand out? Why, why is it so different about others from others? What have you done that has not been done before? So what is the innovation in it? What is the new aspect of this research? Uh, how um, unique is this research? Have you used a new technique or modified an existing one? Have you developed a framework? How does it stand? Um, have you used any new, new stats um, applications or stat modalities for your research? Have you studied a cohort of individuals that haven't been studied before? Is there a new group of people that have never been touched by researchers? So, for example, COVID, you know, in BME, it's a very hype in um, UK uh, and in US and in, across the globe, you know, why COVID is affecting black minority ethnic origin. So if I do a research, you know, that is a unique one, you know, I am looking at something, yeah, but I have to be first in the field. Uh, if I look now, there's hundreds and hundreds of articles around COVID-19 and BME research. How significant is my research? What will people do differently as a result of your work? Implications of other researchers and people in the wider world. 
how how has your knowledge of the world has changed and what is the regard have you chosen a sensible research question have you used the best methodology to answer that question applied standardized techniques and properly validated innovative techniques so when um, you actually use your um, research questionnaire or any um, methods or tools in your research has the tool been validated you know do you have a validated tool for your research and are you in a better position to explain um, that tool within your publication and have you presented your results as clearly and convincingly as possible so presentation of a research and publication they don't coincide you can always present your result and you can always uh, publish your results and you, you can even write about presenting a public uh, presenting your results as a publication so think about different ways so how could we do further work what can you do to improve um, your publication um, as an individual or as a group or as an organization um, i would recommend having some department of strategies and support for the long term um, to develop uh, further publication uh, output from your uh, organization or from your department think about writing groups or trips now we all are um, i'm not sure you all are but uh, i am sitting at home from last four months um, working from home uh, and all we have in our hand is now time um, and i believe time is an investment um, you can invest money and you can invest many things but time is an investment so invest in your networks invest in your, in your friendship like um, smriti has come now invest in your friendship invest in your colleagues um, develop networks talk to people and think about how could you actually uh, work together to actually uh, bring out more collaborative projects bring out more papers out of your collaboration think about um, writing retreats maybe you or your friends or your colleagues work together block a time in your diary and then go on the video but mute and then start writing you know have a paper and start writing for two hours block that time and do as a retreat think about journal clubs you know you have a journal club i'm pretty sure india has journal clubs but the journal clubs i mean is to think about writing the articles not review the articles so try to about think about writing the articles come up with a common theme and start writing analyze published work that is another way think about some take someone's paper think about how you could improve what else could you do out of this paper and working paper repository so from your network from your collaboration from your network uh, you could actually think about writing a, a repository and then pre peer review so before sending to your journal peer review process you can actually develop your own peer review panel so like i said i send my paper to my colleagues they would peer review it for me give strong comments i work on it and then i submit so i don't get that those strong comments to actually uh, make me sad and then um, protecting writing or revising time so you talk to your manager you talk to your departmental head to actually be if you want to develop further in academia you, if you want to develop further as a researcher uh, make sure that you do have some protecting uh, writing or um, research or revising time so that every week you get some time or you ask yourself you know it is an investment for you you take block out some of your time within your diary to actually write do i do that i'm trying to do it um so um try to do that for you and that's it and this is um the reference that i said for the metrics toolkit and um a couple of slides from this uh, is taken from one of my colleague um, dr david lee who is a senior lecturer at manchester metropolitan university um thank you so much um that's it from me i think Thank you, Dr. Manju, for that illustrative presentation and giving us the insight regarding the publication review metrics. Hope all of you must have got some idea that on which journals you are supposed to focus and how to write a good article. 